Imagine that you're sitting in the Manhattan advertising firm Sterling Cooper, and your boss, Don Draper, the creative director of the company, looks you in the eyes to explain how you need to think about advertising a product. Let's say it's a Hershey's chocolate bar. Draper's philosophy hits you square in the face. You are the product. You, feeling something. From a 21st century perspective, it's a moment that captures the essence of a bygone era. An era of capitalism in which advertising a product isn't just about showcasing its desirable qualities, but rather about selling an experience, an emotion, a feeling. Years later, and also in the real world, James Panivisic clarifies what's happening here. You don't buy a Hershey's chocolate bar for a couple of ounces of chocolate. You buy it to recapture the feeling of being loved that you knew when your dad bought you one for mowing the lawn. Draper's onto something big here. His sentiment reflects a fundamental shift in how capitalism would evolve through the power of branding. Now, let's say you're an early capitalist, before Draper's time all the way back to when the industrial society is just taking off. Draper's advice would be irrelevant. In this age, your main drive is to generate cash by putting a price on things that didn't used to have a price. To profit off, say, the commodification of the then common lands or human labor, and later by profiting off innovative consumer products. But in his time, in this evolved stage of capitalism, Draper knows that you don't need to do that anymore. You don't need to efficiently produce and sell good products that people actually crave. In this post-war era, to rake in good money, you simply need to commercialize nostalgia. It's become less about selling a good product and more about the ability to manufacture a desire for your product. What Draper has discovered is so powerful that he's able to charge extra for a product identical to what a competitor might sell. What he's discovered is brand loyalty. Follow his advice and you can raise the price of your product. And because of your brand, your customers will stay loyal and buy your crap. Basically, Draper is giving us an example of how to make money even with an uninventive product all based on your brand. Sounds like good profit, right? Well, it isn't actually profit. Not in the capitalistic sense, anyway. Capitalism as a system triumphed when we commodified land and labor, and this is important, when profit overcame rent. Let's start with that. In feudalism, the predominant economic system in medieval Europe, rents rule the lands. Well, the lords rule the lands, but they do so by collecting rents from their estates. They're so-called fiefs or fiefdoms. Let's say that you're a lord in medieval Europe. I know it's a little further from your reality here, but bear with me. If you're a feudal lord, you rent out your land to vassals. These are barons or knights, and in exchange, you get their allegiance. And importantly, their payment to you in agricultural goods. These vassals don't actually work the land, but they will carry out the work for you. They're sort of a middleman, and they'll work the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. The low-class serfs, the peasants. These serfs will farm your land and basically pay most of their production to you as rent. Sure, they can keep a bit for sustenance, but you need to maintain the status quo around here, so you send in a sheriff or two to police the fief and make sure they don't keep too much. What are you doing? In this age, as a lord, you don't actually really need to do much to accumulate wealth. The fact that you own land in itself gets you paid. <laughs> but as times change and as shipbuilding and navigation and eventually industry and innovation 
open up global trade and competitive share markets, suddenly there's a new way to generate wealth. And it's not just about collecting rent from your land. This is the advent of capitalism. And you can seize the opportunity for serious wealth creation, but you have to embrace profit. Okay, so what is profit in this sense? Isn't it just like rent, another word for generating surplus money? Well, although both rent and profit practically amount to the same thing, there is a somewhat abstract difference between the two. The difference is that rent is not subject to market competition, and profit is. And the reason is, now I'm going to quote Yanis Varoufakis here, the former Greek minister of finance and the author of the book Techno-Feudalism. So, he says, The reason that profit is vulnerable to market competition and that rent is not, is their different origins. Rent flows from privileged access to things fixed in supply like fertile soil or land containing fossil fuels. You can't produce more of these resources, however much money you might invest in them. Profit, in contrast, flows into the pockets of entrepreneurial people who've invested in things that wouldn't otherwise have existed. Things like Edison's light bulb or Jobs' iPhone. It's this fact that these commodities were invented and created, and so can be invented and created again but better by someone else that renders profit vulnerable to market competition. As capitalism takes off, profit seems attractive to you. It doesn't reek of the exploitation that rent relies on. You know, working the serfs, or pretty much de facto slaves. No, rather, profit stands out as a just reward for brave entrepreneurial risk-taking. It does entail some degree of uncertainty, as you might need to navigate the treacherous currents of stormy markets, but if you take the right risk, you'll be rewarded for your efforts. Take Ford, Krupp or Edison, and later Sony and Apple. What do all these companies have in common? They all generate income from profits that overshadow rents. They help establish capitalism as the dominant economic system of the modern era. Krupp pioneers the steel foundry, railway tires that are used for the US railway system, and later the breech loading cannon, the first cannon loaded from the rear. And this pretty much wins wars and really just affirm the value of innovation backed by profit. Ford and Edison both propel their respective companies into mega firms thanks to such innovative ideas and products of which, well, I hardly think I need to mention. Take a cassette out of its case, and most people just see an empty box. But Sony saw something quite different. And let's look at Sony for a classic example. In 1978, Sony's stock price hovers around three US dollars. Then, within just two years, it shoots up to nine dollars before plateauing at six. So it doubles in value in just two years. Why? The Walkman, that's why. Sony invests in something that hasn't existed before. The 1979 Walkman rakes in massive profits, but eventually MP3 players are released and later Apple comes along with the iPod and takes over this whole portable music player market. Sony's profit begin to diminish from the Walkman. And that's the whole point. Sony now needs to make something even better to stay competitive. In a competitive market society, you either innovate or you wither away. That's also why profit is subject to market competition and why rent is not. And why the dominance of profit might have been seen as a moral victory over rent. But wait a second. Remember how I told you about Don Draper? and his whole thing about the magic of advertising, the power of branding, and about how if you have brand loyalty, you don't need to make a good or innovative product to make money. Seems contradictory. If you successfully sell a product because of branding rather than its inherent quality, 
you're not generating profit in this sense. You're generating brand-based rent. Nothing new here is being invented, except an idea. What Draper discovers in the 1950s eventually changes the course of capitalism entirely. Although rent survives its early stages through such businesses as oil, you might know it, in the latter half of the 20th century, rent makes a surefire comeback. No company reflects this shift better than Apple. Apple spends a fortune on advertising. You'd never know it. <laughs> You'd never know it. Apple survives fierce competition from competitors like Blackberry, Sony, and so on. Because of their esteemed brand, Apple's sleek designs mixed with its you know, claimed user-friendliness allows Steve Jobs to charge significant premiums on his products. Premiums that amount to brand rents. But that's not all. Jobs takes it one step further. Not only does he blow fresh air into rent-based income, he helps usher in a new economic age where rent rules supreme once more. What Jobs achieves with the iPhone, he takes further with the App Store. And it's devastating for competitive market capitalism. Let's do one last hypothetical just to tie this whole mess together. This time you're not a capitalist though, nor are you a feudal lord. Let's just say you're a regular old Joe in the 21st century. Imagine that it's a nice slow weekend and you decide to take a trip to a new market that you've discovered in a nearby town. You know, just to check out what the hype's about. As you arrive at the market, People seem to be going about their business, trading gadgets, clothes, and whatnot. Everything seems in order here. It's just another market in, well, just another town. As you walk around and browse the wares in the different stalls, however, you start to notice that the stuff being sold here is, well, it really stands out to you. Like, weirdly so. Pretty much every wear here is great, almost as if tailored specifically to you. Something you want or need, even. And that's when you get a whiff that something about this place is a little bit off. But it's not so easy to put a finger on what it is. Never mind that for now. There is good stuff to be purchased here. As you walk around and browse all the great wares, things get a little weirder though. You see something you want to buy at one of the stalls. So naturally you walk over there and you ask the merchant who's standing there how much it'll cost. The merchant, he seems friendly enough, tells you the price, but to put 40% of what you pay in a jar that sits on the side of his stall. Why? You ask. It's for Jeff, he solemnly answers. He owns all the shops, all the buildings here, and he takes a cut from every single sale being made in this town. He says this quietly, keeping one eye peeled at an ominous looking character, a character you've actually noticed walking around the stalls. That's the sheriff, the merchant tells you. He seems to be keeping track of the stalls, the sheriff. The merchant leans forward to you, but still watchful of the sheriff, and he whispers, you don't want to get on the wrong side of Jeff's algorithm. And that's when it becomes clear. You realize that you're the only outsider here, the only consumer. Where is everyone? The merchant looks at you with a knowing smile. This is all for you, he says. You see, Jeff not only decides what gets sold here, he owns the dirt you walk on, the bench you sit on, and the air you breathe. He owns so much land around here that he's created a distinct market for you and for each and every individual on this planet. The sheriff, the algorithm, it knows you. You've actually told it all about yourself through the data that you've given to Jeff online. That's why all the weirs are so great. And Jeff has trained this algorithm on this data to function optimally as a sheriff. This is no market town, you realize. 
This is no market at all. It all belongs to Jeff. There's no competition between sellers here. No disinterested invisible hand to guide competition. No, there's only an algorithm that carries out Jeff's command. This, of course, is Amazon.com. And essentially what's happening here is that Jeff, okay, let's just call him Bezos at this point, has concentrated the power of Don Draper's genius to implant desires on our mind by knowing exactly what we want and by giving us the ability to buy it with a click with the ability to void competition altogether by owning the entire environment or pseudo market of sale. Jeff owns all the stalls and he gets to decide who stands in them. Jeff Bezos is a techno-feudal lord, just as Steve Jobs was before him. Capitalists, producers and developers alike, who sell their products on Amazon.com or on the App Store, are their vassals. Jeff Bezos, like Steve Jobs did, gives them land to sell their goods on, and they collect a good chunk of the revenue as rent. So this land, which is their platform, the cloud so to speak, is basically their digital fiefdom. Unfortunately, that all means that we're the serfs here. And all the attention and data that we willingly give to guys like Bezos is his produced means of not production, but behavioral modification. And this becomes his capital, his cloud capital. While a central feature of capitalism is the exchange of wages for labor, you know, to produce capital for the capitalist, Bezos relies on free labor, our attention and data, to accumulate his cloud capital. That's what makes this platform viable, you know, just as serfs made their lord's land viable. And similarly, we aren't getting paid for it. In the end, Bezos gets richer without needing to lift a finger. Since the SP500 index hit its latest low in October 2022, seven stocks, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Nvidia, and Tesla have collectively risen 117%, far outpacing the performance of the other 493 companies in the SP500. Together, these stocks have become known as the Magnificent Seven. That's a recent headline from the New York Times. What do these Magnificent Seven have in common? They all have significant cloud capital that they use to accumulate cloud rents. You might have heard about how the economy is doing great right now, how the SP500 is at an all-time high. But at the same time, you might not have noticed it in your daily life. I mean, just look at the home price to median household income ratio in the US. Housing has gotten increasingly unaffordable when compared to our median disposable income. And this isn't just a US phenomenon. Much of the money that has advanced our economy since the crash of 2008 has gone into the pockets of techno-feudalist lords. So the economy is doing great and all, but only for this like top tier class of people, the techno feudal lords. Right, so we get it, it's all really bad for the common folk then. But aren't we still operating in a capitalist system? Why is this video called Beyond Capitalism? Why shouldn't we just call this platform capitalism, hyper capitalism or something of that sort? Well, I think it's only appropriate to give the final word to Yannis Varoufakis himself here, who'll describe it better than I would do by my paraphrasing. In the same way, however, that it wouldn't be wrong for Adam Smith not to refer to the new capitalist system as capitalist, but to refer to it as an industrial profit-driven feudalism. By dropping the word feudalism mm. in the early 19th century, intellectuals, especially in Britain at the time, helped us understand that this was a big thing. It was a great transformation. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to alert people to the fact that we have a very different world now, where the laws of society that prevailed before 2010, 2015, 2020 no longer prevail. 
So if you want a deeper dive into this subject, check out Yanis Varoufakis' newest book, Techno Feudalism, which goes into all this and way more, and from which this video is pretty much entirely based. You can probably find the book on Amazon. Now, do you think we're heading into a techno feudal age? And also, you can support me by liking and subscribing and by checking out my other content on my channel. Thank you so much.